All right, cool. Hello, fellow documentarians. I'm so excited to be here today giving a talk. I first came to Write the Docs three years ago, and I was blown away. We worked in XML. I came to Write the Docs. I discovered Markdown. I discovered GitHub. I discovered that these are my people, and it just knocked me out. So then I came back two years ago. I submitted a proposal, and I was invited to be on a panel. And the topic of the panel was transforming your documentation process. And we talked about moving from the, the old tool chain to the new tool chain. And that was cool, but it's always been a dream of mine to get up here by myself and give a talk. So I'm excited. So I've been a tech writer for almost two decades. It's a long time. When I joined Microsoft um, in 2000, uh, Windows 2000 was just coming out, and one of the ways that we shipped our documentation, believe it or not, was hard copy. So, so I had a couple volumes that was about that thick of the driver docs sitting on my desk. It weighed several pounds, and it was very old school. Things have definitely changed a lot since then, including my approach to tech writing. When I joined, I was very enthusiastic, but I was missing a few key ideas. So over the next half hour, I'll share with you seven essential tips that have helped me over the course of my career. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's get started. All right, so I love this picture. This makes me want to go frolic in the forest, <laughs> which is exactly what we did on Saturday. How many people went to the hike? It's a great hike. I'd recommend it if you didn't have a chance to do it this year. Come back, come early, go on the hike. It's a great way to meet your fellow documentarians before the conference begins and get some fresh air. Uh, so two years ago, when I came to this conference, uh, I went on the hike, and I met a young tech writer named Jacob. Jacob had just graduated from college at the University of Texas, Denton, and he came all the way to Portland for Write the Docs. What struck me about Jacob is that he asked a lot of questions. He found out I worked at Microsoft, he wanted to know what that was like, what my day as a tech writer was like, he was just asking questions, questions. And then when I got back to Seattle, a couple days later, I received an email from Jacob in which he asked me if I would be a guest on his podcast. He had a podcast called The Not Boring Technical Writer. It was, it was great. So we did a podcast called uh, How to Future Proof Yourself as a Technical Writer. And that talk was the foundation, that podcast was the foundation for this talk. So Jacob was practicing the first tip I'm gonna share with you today, which is just ask. Our eight-year-old daughter drew this picture. This is her third trip to Write the Docs. She's very excited about Write the Docs. She actually wears a Write the Docs t-shirt when she goes to bed. <laughs> and she helped, me, she helped me build this presentation, so that's pretty cool. So I took a cue from Jacob, and I, re I turned the podcast into a proposal, and I asked Write the Docs if I could present. And guess what? They said no. So I asked, if they had, I asked another question. I asked if they had any feedback for how I could make it better next time. They were kind enough to give me some tips. I tried again, and I asked again this year if I could present, and this time they said yes. So, sometimes opportunities won't present themselves, but if you just ask, you'll find, you might find that a door opens for you. So, Asking is about starting a conversation and opening yourself to new possibilities. So let me share with you some of my favorite questions. Sometimes people come into my office, you probably have this, and they start right in the middle of the problem. They say, I'm getting this error, this is happening. And frequently you have to back them out to get the context. You have to say, what were you trying to do? How did this start? Anytime you start in 
explaining to someone where you're coming from, you need to give them that context. So I think of this, asking this question as drawing out a story. We'll talk more about storytelling later. Um, a related point, question you can ask is, how did you get started with that? Say, for example, you find out your colleague is learning JavaScript. You might say, how did you get started with that? And I find that this question frequently leads to serendipitous discoveries. Your friend might say, well, I saw on this Twitter account, that, or I get this YouTube channel, or this particular resource. So um, people, pe I'm kind of known at work for asking people, how did you get started with that? I just find it a really useful question. Ask, can I join? One of my feature teams has a regular feature team meeting once a week, but it came to my attention that they also have a higher level executive strategic meeting that influences the, the development of the feature that I document. So I thought, wow, strategic meeting, maybe I could attend that. So I found out who owned the meeting, and I just said, hey, can I dial into this? And to my surprise, he said yes. And as a result, I get some good insight what's coming down the pike before I have to document it. So ask, can I join? Ask, what's your opinion? Sometimes the quieter people in the room don't speak up, and we need everyone's opinion, right? So ask people, hey, what's your opinion about this issue? Uh, it's a useful question to ask. Ask by showing up. So Microsoft is a really big place. It has a lot of buildings. So my feature team used to be in a separate building from the one I'm in. And I would walk over and camp out in the lounge of the feature team, the coffee room. And when they came in first thing in the morning, they would see me. And inevitably, they would say something like, oh, seeing you reminds me. Here's this very important thing I've been meaning to tell you. <laughs> so you can ask by just being in the right place at the right time. How does my request fit in your priority list? One of my program managers would send me this question first thing in the morning, at the point when I was still deciding what I was gonna do that day. And even if I planned to do other things, just seeing that, that advertising, that touch point in my head, it would remind me and it would increase the odds that I would address his request at some point during the course of the day. So that's the value of a, of a lightweight ping. Okay, so now you've asked. Now what? A couple months ago, we made some really big changes to our API documentation. We implemented native header reflection, which is a really fancy way of saying, Windows has daily headers that sit over here, we have documentation that sits over here in a separate repo, and at build time, we integrate the two and publish it. The result of this is that, for the first time in a long time, the headers, or for the first time ever, the headers are guaranteed to match the docs. So that's pretty cool. But the result of doing this was that we, we radically changed the organization of the documentation. So you'll see that it's now organized by header file. So we went live with that, that was great. Then, a couple days later, we got feedback from one of our MVPs, and it was a detailed rant. He sent us screenshots, he sent us highlighted text, he sent us lots of verbatims, he did not like the new system. He missed the old system, and he wanted it back. But when we took the time to dig in and figure out what he was actually asking us for, we discovered that we could make a small number of relatively low-cost changes that not only addressed his feedback, but made the new system that much better. So the principle here, so he was a happy customer, happy customers are good. The principle here is listen for intent, so that's tip number two. First, seek to understand. Before you could add any value 
you have to understand where someone is coming from. In our MVP's case, it sounded like he wanted an overhaul, but he actually just wanted a few specific changes. Some of you might be familiar with Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It came out a while ago, but it's still really relevant. One of my favorite principles in it is seek first to understand, then to be understood. So, listening is something that Microsoft has done a lot more, has been doing a lot more of recently. Last time I was on stage here, I told you about our shiny new collaborative doc platform, docs.microsoft.com. Since then, we've made a few improvements. One of the improvements, we just went live with this a couple months ago, is this button here, give documentation feedback. And that enables a customer this is the bottom of a docs.microsoft.com page. So they can be on the documentation page, and they can click that button, and that opens an issue in the GitHub repo where the source for this page is stored. So they don't even have to go to GitHub. So since we went live with this, we've really seen an uptick in the amount of targeted, relevant feedback. And we can actually have conversations right here. If someone adds to the issue on GitHub, that shows up on this page. So we can have a lot of, of meaningful conversation with our customers. And because it's tied into your GitHub username, we receive virtually no spam. So that's, we used to have an email link and we would, we would just get a lot of spam. So this has been really, a really valuable way for us to listen to our customers. We also get millions of hits on our live pages which is another listening tool that helps us figure out what we want to keep, what we need to beef up, what we might want to get rid of. So when you combine the data analysis with, with the customer conversations we can have, the result is that we're much, be able, much better able to figure out what our customers want. So we're a lot better at listening. So, listening is great. Now it's time to start writing. Back in the old days, when I started writing a new project, my mentality was that I needed to build the whole building before sharing it with anyone. That doesn't work today. Today is all about continuous publishing, getting the, getting the information out as fast as possible. So now the way I think of it, um, one of the lightning talks yesterday mentioned chunking your information. So I think of taking the smallest chunks of information, getting those down and building a scaffolding, and getting that built as fast as possible and then getting it out for collaboration. Um, how many of you use Twitter? I love Twitter. Twitter's great. And the reason I think it's great is because it chunks information. You can have like a big story that's contained in a small space. Um, so you, do you know that feeling when you have an idea that you want to tweet? It's in your head and you have to think, how am I going to shrink that into 280 characters? That's what I think about when I start writing my docs. I start thinking, what are those little chunks so that I can build the scaffolding? So the goal is to write the tiniest chunks of truth and get people collaborating much sooner. So here's an example of a tweet condensing a big reality into a small space. It's one of my favorite hashtags. So it's a fun thought exercise to think, how can I boil steps down into tweets. So give your docs the Twitter test. Find out what your customers need and get them there fast. Okay. Tip number four, ownership. I think of ownership in two different aspects. Let's take them one at a time. The first aspect is own your own stuff. 
it's easy to slip into the mentality when you start as a technical writer that you are powerless and the feature team owns all the things, right? We've all had that feeling. But the real truth is this. You own a chunk of documentation like a developer owns a chunk of code. So be proactive with it. Uh, Neil Kaplan gave a great talk this morning, and he was talking about how no one else is going to drive it for you, especially the docs. Docs are frequently an afterthought to a developer. So you have to be on top of it, you drive it, you make the decisions, you set the schedule. I had a colleague once, let's call him Tom. And every time Tom needed to deliver his documentation, he would say, that team over there didn't do their, their work, so I don't have my work done. And ever since I worked with him, it's been burned into my brain that you have to own your stuff as a writer. Um, so just remember, you're the driver. Trust me, I document drivers. I like to think of it this way. Sure, you're gonna ask a bunch of people for feedback on your docs before you push them out the door. You're gonna get tech review. But when it comes to the final decisions, ask for input, own the output. How many have been to Venice? Beautiful city. This is the lovely Rialto Bridge. I'm sure those are all tech writers. The reason I'm showing you a picture of a bridge is because I think of tech writing as a quintessential bridge job. At the heart of it, you're taking an internal developer feature reality and you're connecting it to what external customers need to know to get their job done. So that's a bridge. But tech writing is also a bridge between a lot of other disciplines. Tech writers can connect dev to test or test to the customer. Um, so, one thing we do a lot of at Microsoft is self-hosting, dogfooding the product. So this enables us to be a bridge back to the back to the feature team. So we can we can serve as testers in that way. Um, I serve the bridge role every day when I look at the GitHub issues that I told you about uh, to connect, and then I translate to connect the customers to the feature team. So as tech writers, I think we're in a really unique position to tie disciplines together and to be that bridge, and that's a way that we can add value to the product as a whole. So ownership is the stuff that you own, like your documentation, but then there's your influence in the product as a whole. So be that bridge in the organization. Tip number five, be a lifelong learner. So automation. What I mean here is have a preferred super tool that you learn that enables you to do quick scripting, to automate things, uh, just to make yourself more efficient. So about 10 years ago, my manager came to me and said, I'd like to compile some statistics on how much our documentation has changed over the last few months. And I thought, I've heard of this thing called Windows PowerShell. And I thought, I wonder if I could use that to get those stats. So I spent a few hours, I wrote some lines of code, figured out how to do it. Then a few weeks later, I needed to query some XML. So I thought, let's learn how to do that in PowerShell. And as time went by, every time I would take an hour or two, it doesn't take long, you can learn in tiny bursts, I would add to my library, and the result now is that I have a pretty big library of functionality that I can share with my team and that we can use to be more efficient. So you could learn Python or regular expressions are great, but have that super tool. Teaching. You never really know something until you can teach it. 
So learn cool stuff and then teach other people. It's a great way to learn. Mentoring. At Microsoft, we actually have a formal mentoring program. And it doesn't matter where in your career you are. You could be an executive, you could be a newbie. Mentoring is just a great learning opportunity. And it's a two-way opportunity. I frequently find that I learn just as much, if not more, from my mentees than I probably teach them. So be a mentor. Know your strengths, but also know your opportunities for development. One of my former managers, I'll call him Dan, because his name's Dan and he said I could tell this story, <laughs> um, struck me as a very comfortable, very at ease in front of large groups. So one day I went to him and I said, Dan, what's the secret? How are you, how are you so comfortable doing public speaking? And he said, it wasn't always that way. He said he'd actually identified it as an area for improvement and he'd spent a whole year seeking out any and all opportunities that would force him to get up and speak in front of a group. And after that year, the result was the accomplished public speaker that I saw. At Microsoft, ever since Satya got into town, every summer we have this event called the Hackathon. So this is a one-week event in the summer in which everyone at the company is encouraged to work either as, as a small team or individually and just hack up cool stuff, connect products, build things, work together. They actually set up tents on the main campus and everybody, it's just a huge, huge learning opportunity. So you might not have something like that at your company, but the, the, the model of the hackathon I think is really relevant. It's a great way to learn. So, always keep learning. How many of you have been in this situation? You're in a meeting room with your manager, your team, and your manager says, we have this new feature, I need a volunteer. If you're like me, that makes you want to kind of shrink back in your chair and be invisible. But, try this instead. Raise your hand and opt in. Opting in is kind of the flip side of just ask, which was the first tip I shared with you. Jacob asked me to be in his podcast, and I opted in. And kind of as a result of that, I'm giving this talk. So by opting in, you can start these chain reactions of serendipity that might lead you to places that you didn't think you would be in. So. Opt in. Go for an opportunity and pretty soon you'll find yourself surfing the wave. Um, a couple years ago when I came to Rock the Docs for the first time, I heard about all the open publishing goodness. I went back to Microsoft. I found some like-minded people who were already building the docs.microsoft.com platform and we worked together. And now, three years later, MSDN is going away. Docs has probably tens of millions of pages and they're all in markdown. So Microsoft saw an opportunity here and opted in. So after you opt in and you're starting a new opportunity, you'll definitely want to keep in mind tip number seven. Use the power of storytelling. This one is a global tip. It doesn't matter what profession you're in. At Microsoft, when new program managers join the company, they receive a welcome packet. It contains a book called Resonate, which is about storytelling. Then they receive storyteller training that helps them use storytelling to get better business results. So storytelling is big at Microsoft. Anybody here ever watch the TED Talks? I know, you're at a TED Talk right now. <laughs> by far, the most common element shared by TED Talks that go viral is personal stories. 
So stories are key. What about in documentation? When you tell a story in the docs, frequently your goal is affecting change or persuading. So I had a case recently where I needed to persuade our customers to do a few extra steps. Now remember that I write driver documentation, which is some of the driest documentation on earth. That is a, that is a desert. But storytelling can even help here. So Microsoft recently invented a thing called universal drivers. It required that developers jump through a few extra hoops to get to a long-term, better reality. So here's how I documented it. First, I described the pain of the current reality. Then, I described the obstacles, the steps they had to go through using the minimal things scaffolding that I told, told you about. I gave my docs the Twitter test. Then, I described the better place they'd get to if they opted in, where they could write their code once and have it work magically across device form factors. So, status quo, steps to get to a new reality, and then the incredible awesomeness of where they will get to. Tap into the power of storytelling and use it to explain why the world is a better place with your company's products. You might have noticed that I've actually been telling you stories the entire time I've been up here. First I told you about Jacob, then I told you about our upset MVP, then I told you about Tom, who had issues with proactivity, I told you about Dan, my former manager, who now loves to get up in front of a crowd, maybe a little bit too much. So whatever company or culture you're part of, people crave stories. So my advice to you is, it's always a good time to practice your storytelling. Tell stories everywhere you go. So there you have it, seven essential tips for being a more effective technical writer in the modern world. First, we talked about just ask, put yourself in the field of play and see what happens. Listen with all your attention. Create your scaffolding of minimum things. Give it the Twitter test. Uh, practice ownership. First of all, own your own stuff, but then be a bridge across disciplines because as tech writers, we're uniquely positioned to add this value to the product. Um, be a lifelong learner, opt in, and use the power of storytelling. So it's a long way from 20 pounds of printed docs when I arrived, but I think these tips show the direction that our discipline is evolving. Data analysis and rapid collaboration, customer focus, faster learning, and connecting. But wait, I almost forgot. There actually exists, lo and behold, a magical eighth tip. <laughs> That's our daughter, who drew the picture earlier, sharing with you a tiny but mighty bonus tip. Give praise. This only takes a couple minutes or a couple seconds, but it's incredible how many people don't do it. Try it and you will discover the highest benefit to cost ratio you will ever see. Let me show you how easy it is to say thanks. Are you ready? Thank you for listening. I hope these tips help you as you continue in your career. Here are some extra goodies to check out. Brian McDonald, not to be confused with Brian MacDonald, who spoke earlier, but Brian McDonald is a, a screenwriter and a teacher based in Seattle um, who was very influential in my learning about how stories are constructed. Uh, he wrote a book called Invisible Ink. It's a very short book, but Invisible Ink means it tells you he has a seven component model where each story has these seven elements in it. So Invisible Ink is what's, what's behind the story. It's a great book, you should pick it up. Brian's done other books and he's in, also in podcasts. 
There's a link to um, a summary of, of my talk. If you didn't get all the bullets, um, I will tweet that out after. I mentioned Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I would like to say a special thanks to my team at Microsoft and my family, all of whom listened to multiple versions of this talk, probably more times than they would have preferred, and gave me so much great feedback. Finally, there's my Twitter handle. I encourage you to follow me. I'd love to continue the conversation either online or in person here at the conference. And that's it. Thank you so much. Enjoy the conference. <laughs>